Good noon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. According to my various clocks, well, they've all got different times on them, but I think we're close enough, close enough for bank work, right? Of course. <laughs> Okay, today we are looking at starting a new chapter, Luke 17, and um, would anyone be kind enough to offer an opening word of prayer? Anyone at all? Let me see. I'm looking around for deaconesses on here. Let's see. Who do we have as a deaconess? I believe we have Mrs. Himes. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father. Our Father. Who art in heaven. How be your Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our, our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine, For thine is the kingdom, kingdom and, the and the power, and, and the glory, the glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Margaret, do you have an opening tune for us? Yes. This is my father's world. Yes, Hang it on. is. Thank God it is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's try this. Okay. Thank you, Margaret. Welcome. Okay. In our lesson today, chapter 17 of Luke, we're going to struggle through the first 10 verses of this book. And um, I'm going to ask someone to read all... 10 verses to start with. Um, who would volunteer to do that? How about you, Linda? Okay, this is from the NIV. Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck 
than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as much as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Wouldn't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink? Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Okay, thank you so much. So in those 10 verses, we're going to break these up to unpack this information uh, based on offenses that we're talking about in verses one and two, trespasses that we're talking about in verses three and four, faith in verses five and six, and then servants in verses seven through 10. And looking back at the first two verses where we're talking about offenses, it starts out by saying Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's saying to them that offenses or temptations to sin are always going to come, always going to come. But woe to that person through whom they come. It's going to be better for that person to be thrown into the sea with a millstone hung around his neck than it is to offend one of these uh, little ones. So let's first look at this thing called offend or offenses. Uh, in verse one, it talks about offenses which literally in the noun form, it's a movable stick or a trigger or a trap stick. So it's a snare, it's a trap, it's an impediment uh, that's in the way that's causing a person to stumble and fall. And so any person or a thing by which the person is entrapped is the one who brings these offenses. They're drawing a person into error and a person into sin. Now in verse two, they use the verb form of offenses. Um, in the Greek, this verb form of offenses means to put a stumbling black block or an impediment in the way of someone to trip and fall, to entice someone to sin, to cause someone to judge someone unfairly or unfavorably or unjustly to cause someone to, to fall away and to cause someone to distrust or desert someone or something that they actually should trust and obey. So this whole business of offenses in the Greek is basically setting traps and putting stumbling blocks in the way of someone. Verse one says that it's basically impossible for offenses not to come. 
they will come. Although these offenses are inevitable, these stumbling blocks, the sin is an inevitable, it does not eliminate personal responsibility. So for the individual who is the cause of these temptations, Jesus says, woe to the one who, who they come from. Um, those who cause others to stumble, especially the young, they're actually doomed to a severe punishment. And Jesus is saying it would be better for them to have this stone tied around their neck and to be thrown into the sea rather than to offend or cause to stumble or cause to sin one of these little ones. So in verse two, Jesus says drowning with a millstone around your neck is actually better for you than to offend one of these little ones. So it indicates to us that if you're the cause of offenses, if you're the cause of stumbling blocks, your punishment is going to be quite severe. If Jesus is saying it's better for you to go ahead and drown yourself, uh, that means his punishment for you or your upcoming punishment is going to be extremely severe. And let's look a little bit at, at, at this millstone. Uh, a millstone was a large circular stone that was used for grinding grain. So it's a stone that weighed several hundred pounds and it was used, it was turned by a donkey walking around a circular track pulling the stone. So this is not just a, a ordinary brick that you kind of build a house with. No, this grinding stone weighed several hundred pounds. And Jesus is saying, it's better for you to hang one of these around your neck and be drowned than to offend one of these little ones. So this is some serious, serious business that Jesus is, is talking about here. But he's all he's introducing this in verse one that's saying it's going to happen. There are going to be offenses. There are going to be stumbling blocks. There are going to be things that try, try to throw you off course. But the one who is perpetuating this, the one who is causing it, are in for some severe punishment. So let's look at these little ones. What does he mean by these little ones? Well, these are believers. They're God's children who are under his care. Also, they're described as those who have humbled themselves like children. Um, those who believe in Christ, who have begun to follow him, and they're also referring to these disciples as their young ones. And it's also referring to people that are young in age, like children. So little ones can indicate those who are young in the faith and those that are also young in age. So it covers a broad category of believers. The key thing is these are believers in Christ. So all of that deals with what it means for offenses to occur. And what we learn from verses one and two is that they will occur. Uh, no question. They're there. We have all stumbled over something. We've all been tempted by something. So offenses come. But we are also understand that there is punishment for it, particularly strong punishment if it causes someone who is new in the faith or someone who is young to be turned away from Christ. So moving on to verses three and four, where it talks about 
trespasses. Here it says, take heed or watch yourself. And it said in the King James, it says, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. If he repent, forgive him. If he tresp if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee and say, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. So it's the Christian's duty to deal straightforwardly with sin, particularly when it occurs. And it says in verse three, if thy brother trespass against thee, that means this person is also a believer. But this believer that trespasses or sins against you needs to be confronted, needs to be corrected. So looking back at other passages like Matthew 18, 15, for example, it says the goal of this rebuke, which it says in verse three, these they need to be rebuked. The goal of the rebuke is restoration. And if it's successful, according to Matthew, he says you have gained your brother. So this is a fellow believer who has fallen into a trespass against you. So step one is to tell him his fault privately. Uh, not to go to a group of your buds and friends and talk about this person, but to go privately. Um, sin cannot be overlooked, but it must be rebuked. So that repentance and restoration cannot really occur unless the sin is confronted and rebuked. And remember, the goal is for repentance and restoration. So the standard teaching within Judaism is that three times, three instances of forgiveness reflects a forgiving spirit. So it was considered honorable in Judaism to forgive someone three times when they repent of whatever they've done against you. Peter, back in the book of Matthew, actually doubled that number. Peter said, how about seven times? What if I forgive seven times? Peter thought he was being very generous in his forgiving. He said seven times, that was generous. And this probably reflected his desire to, for it to be seven. That meant the seven is the number of completion. So in Peter's mind, seven is a gracious plenty to forgive someone for trespassing against you. Jesus's response to Peter, in essence, is that forgive to forgive really you forgiving countless times um, and to Peter and to those hearing it, this was astonishing. I mean, three times was, was acceptable. Peter offered seven times. That was like really being magnanimous. And here Jesus comes along and says, no, we're talking countless times. Time. So Jesus' disciples, who were a part of this new covenant community, were going to have to exceed whatever the standard was. And as I mentioned, the standard for Judaism was three times forgiveness. Peter suggested, how about seven times, thinking he was going way beyond what the standard was. But under this new covenant with Jesus, all of the standard was being challenged. And Jesus was expecting his people to exceed whatever was the standard. So 
this verse says seven times in a day. That's just not seven times, but it's like continually. Um, the number seven is not a number that's a set number of times to forgive, but it's actually speaking of the opposite. Christ meant that forgiveness should be granted unendingly, unendingly. So repentance, however, is necessary for forgiveness. It's absolutely necessary. It's an absolutely necessary qualification for forgiveness. A person must repent. So if I'm to be forgiven, I must repent. God will not forgive me if I don't repent. So God then, if he will not forgive, if the person, the individual does not repent, then God does not require that you and I forgive outside of repentance. Um, in our verses, it says, how many times will a person trespass against you? And if he repents, if you look at verses three and four, there are a lot of ifs in, in those verses. It says, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. If he repent, forgive him. And then in verse four, if he trespasses against thee seven times a day, forgive him every time he repents. So you see there the forgiveness is tied to repentance. And if God does not forgive, outside of a person an individual repenting then he we cannot go beyond what god does so if god doesn't do it we don't have to do it either if a person is not repenting so even if you can't forgive someone because they won't repent because you know a lot of times people do things that they don't even think there's anything wrong with it. Uh, even though it's a sin, it's a trespass. They think it's okay. Um, in that case, if they won't repent, Jesus's followers have been taught that you still cannot harbor pain and bitterness in your heart because someone else will not repent you know when jesus was on the cross that crowd down around that cross they had no inclination to repent but jesus prayed and he prayed father forgive them you forgive them for they do not know what they're doing Jesus, we notice in his statement, did not forgive the people who crucified him, those who were mocking him, those down, the soldiers. He didn't forgive any of that. What he did do was pray to his father, said, Father, you forgive them. I'm putting this situation in your hands. So Jesus committed all of this to God, for God to issue any kind of forgiveness. So in our hearts, if we encounter sin against us, trespass against us, and the person or the individual responsible or committing the trespass does not repent, our response is to pray to God that that the heart of that individual, that God will deal with their hearts. Even though they have not repented to us, we are not obligated to forgive on our end, but we are obligated, like Jesus hanging on that cross, 
to continue to love our enemy and you love your enemy by praying for your enemy, which is what Jesus did. So if we're going to be a reflection if our lives and beliefs in Christ are going to be a reflection of what he did, then we have to recognize that he committed his situation to Father God, saying, God, you forgive them. Because God is the one who could work on the hearts of these individuals. And in God's own way and in God's own time, perhaps some of them would repent. But Jesus committed this situation to God. So um, our, our goal, our commitment is like Jesus's in that we are committed to pray, to pray for those individuals who either will not repent or don't even recognize their need to repent but we commit it to God. So when we move on to verses five and six, five says, and the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. And Jesus goes on with this explanation of the mustard seed. Now I want you to look back at the very first verse <laughs> In chapter 17, verse 1, it starts out by saying, Then said he unto the who. Who did he say? Who is he pointing to? Disciples. Disciples. In verse 5, who is speaking? How does it describe the one speaking in verse 5? The apostles say apostles, apostles. Okay, so verse one it calls them disciples. In verse five it calls them apostles. What's the difference? A disciple is a a learner, a pupil, a student. That's a disciple. An apostle is one who's been sent one who's going to carry out the teaching, carry out the duty. So we're switching now from the student mode in verse one, where they're learning, and we've got the group now being called apostles, where they're actually going to be sent out. And these apostles, who were also disciples, are now telling Jesus, increase our faith. So in verse six, it goes on to say, Jesus begins to speak. And he says, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say to this sycamore tree or to this mulberry tree, be thou plucked up by the root and be thou planted in the sea and it should obey you. So if you have faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, may you be uprooted and thrown into the sea and it would obey you. So verses five and six focus on faith. Faith is like a seed. It's small, it's weak but it has life in it, just like a seed does. And if it's cultivated, it will grow and release power. Uh, when people sin repeatedly, giving up on them is pretty easy. I mean, we humans give up on folks pretty easily. So, and if this is a person who repeatedly offends and repeatedly trespasses, then it's pretty easy to give up on that. Just watch the news every day. It's pretty easy to give up on some people. But we must trust God to work in their lives 
And we ourselves have to become stepping stones and not stumbling, stumbling blocks. So verse five says, actually it indicates that it takes faith to for, perform whatever the duty is we've been called to do. Um, the disciples felt inadequate in the face of these strong, these high standards that Jesus had set for them. So what the disciples are implying is that if we have to do that much forgiving Jesus, we need more faith. So the disciples thought their faith was inadequate. And they probably felt that way because they saw how impossible it would be to do what Jesus told them to do about forgiveness, to do that on their own. Who could forgive such chronic sinful behavior? Who can continue to do that, Jesus? So the disciples most likely were recognizing that they they were pretty much substandard in their in their faith. So they're asking Jesus, you know, Jesus, if you want us to live up to this, you you've got to increase our faith. So true faith basically represents surrender to the will of God. So what Jesus was teaching is that both the source and the object of genuine faith is God. So even though we might have a weak faith, might have mustard seed faith, even in a very small amount of faith, if it's in, if it's genuine trust in God, it can lead to remarkable results because nothing is impossible with God. So the mustard seed was actually the smallest seed used by farmers and gardeners in the Holy Land at that time. So under favorable conditions, this mature mustard seed plant would grow to a tree of at least 10 feet in height. So how much faith then do we need since Jesus had told his followers, you're going to have to continue to forgive no matter how many times you're offended and trespassed against if the person asks ask for forgiveness, that if they repent, then you have to forgive. Disciples figured, you know, Jesus, that's a lot. Uh, that's, that's too much for our little puny faith. So rather than Jesus, Jesus said, rather than giving his disciples a formula for increasing their faith, Jesus pictured faith as a seed. Plant a seed and it grows. And using even little faith, it will grow too. So a, oh, consider wow. <laughs> a consideration is that perhaps a consideration is perhaps we don't need to pray that God will increase our faith. Rather, we may need to ask him to help us use whatever faith it is we have. And we've all been given a measure of faith according to Romans chapter 12, verse three, it says in that verse, for I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So we've all been given a measure of faith. So the faith that we 
have the kind of faith it is, it's more important the kind of faith we have than the how much faith we have. A small amount of faith, even faith the size of what Jesus called mustard seed faith, very tiny faith, can still accomplish great things if that small amount of faith is placed in a great and mighty God. So we cannot generate faith. We cannot produce faith because faith is a gift from God. And it's even listed in 1 Corinthians 12 as one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is the gift of faith. So once we accept Christ, we're given a measure of faith from the Holy Spirit. So like that sycamore tree or that, that uh, mulberry tree, sometimes unforgiveness and bitterness send deep, strong roots down within a person, just like a, one of these mulberry trees. They've got deep, strong roots. And an individual's unforgiveness and bitterness can also have deep, strong roots. But through faith in Jesus, believers' faith in Jesus, Jesus can rip those roots out clean. He can pull up the roots and plant that tree in the seed. So using that analogy of that mustard seed, um, and the sycamore mulberry tree, that level of faith, even a small amount of faith that's placed in the right person, in the, in the Jesus, the Christ, Jesus can uproot those deeply rooted, bitter, evil, unforgiving roots and rip those out. Um, so we have, we need faith. We have faith for a lot of things to get things done in life. We need faith for that. Um, sometimes our faith is strong in certain areas. Sometimes it's weak in certain areas. Um, one of the things that we heard at the funeral service yesterday was Brother Ellis's faith. And of course, we don't know whether he had strong faith or weak faith, but we can see the result of his faith through his family. So faith in Christ Jesus can have strong impacts, whether that faith is mustard seed size or whether it's a large amount of faith that we've been given that faith can make things happen, can change things. So when it uses the analogy of uprooting this deeply rooted mulberry tree, if that faith is placed in Christ, placed in God Almighty, then we have that all-powerful advocate who can uproot anything, uproot that tree at toss it into the sea. And that's because we placed our faith in the right thing, not because we had either a strong faith or a tiny mustard seed faith. It's where that faith is placed. So that's what Jesus is trying to show his apostles that are going to be going out. When he laid out what his expectation was, they said, oh, wow, Jesus, we just, we need, you got to give us more faith. We can't forgive that much on our own. But Jesus goes on to teach that it's not the size of your faith. It's where you place your faith. And then we get down to verses seven through 10 when it talks about 
servants. Um, seven says when you have a servant comes in from plowing, taking care of sheep, does the master say to the servant, come in and eat with me? And basically, Jesus says, no. The, the master will say, prepare my meal and put on your apron and serve me while I eat. Then you can eat later. And does the master thank the servant for doing what he was told to do? Jesus says, of course he does not. So in the same way, when Jesus is saying, Jesus, all of this is in red in your red letter Bible, says in the same way, when you obey me, and this is what Jesus is saying, you should say, we are unworthy servants who have simply done our duty. So this unworthy servant is not worthy of any special honor by doing what they've been told to do. So Jesus used an example that's familiar to the people of his culture. Um, he is not saying that the master has a right to be unappreciative of his servants or to, to disrespect his servants. What he's simply using is an example of the servant's attitude. A servant merely did what he was told to do. Jesus wanted his disciples to see that strong faith or faith should not lead to some sort of spiritual pride. So our prayers should not be based on an attitude that you know, if, if I do this, then God will give me that. No, that's the wrong attitude. A servant or slave as, the, as it's used in scripture, God gives us whatever he gives us by his grace, not through anything that we bring to the table because we bring pretty much nothing to the table. So God gives anything to us on the basis of his grace. And it's not a reward for good behavior. How many of you can remember back in the day, uh, and you can pretty much admit this, but um, would you have... No. Can't hear you. He's frozen. So it's something going on with Wyvern's internet. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. And she may have to come out and come back in. I'm going to call her.
Okay, I think I'm back in. Live. Am I back in? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. And your last thing was talking about even though the master may be appreciative of what we do, he's not going to do it necessarily. Um, say that he's appreciative we do what we do for God out of duty. Okay. So God's grace is what gives us what we have. Okay. Did y'all hear that part? Yes, I did. Yes. 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 Okay, good. And then I asked the question. Did you hear the question that I asked? No. Oh. Okay. Oh. Okay. That's Let's when go. you froze. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully I won't freeze this time. So I wanted to ask you back in the day, how many of you would have asked for either a reward or to be paid uh, for doing what your mom or dad or grandparent told you to do? How many of you will admit that you asked them to pay you? No. <laughs> no. no. Well, no. <laughs> but you thought you deserved maybe a little something if you did, a, you know, like really? a little, so if you, you know, they told to wash the dishes, make up your bed. You thought you ought to be paid for that? No, no, no. no. no but no. if you did something else that was extra, you know, you were good for a period of time or whatever, then they would give you, you would think that they would give you a little something. You know what I mean? So you, Not that you were paid for your chores. No. So you thought you were good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Doesn't mean they thought you were. Especially good grace. So I think Jesus' point is sometimes we expect God to reward us because we think we're good. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's what I was trying to say. Right. Yeah, I heard that there were some privileged kids in the world that actually received a, a weekly allowance. That never happened in our house. Mine either. Either. <laughs> now, we, we, we didn't know what allowance was. Thank you. <laughs> well, I got 50 cents for working all day on Saturday, coming to town to help my daddy pedal, which I hated. <laughs> my parents allowed me to eat and stay in the house. Yeah. We clothe you. We feed you. You have a roof over your head. You know? That's right. Well, I'm different. I'm different. I guess I was one of the privileged kids that yeah, got an allowance from the time I was about 13 years old up until I finished high school. Wow. Yeah, you were privileged. But, yeah. Well, but I, I <laughs> not only did I get the allowance, the allowance was put into a um a checking account. I had my own checking account with my name on the checkbook. But I had to learn how to uh, manage money with that. There were rules with that allowance now. I had to learn how to manage uh manage that money, not bounce any checks. So, so gotta, I guess I was a privileged kid. You were. <laughs> you got an early so so that was real, huh? That wasn't a myth. Say so what? So that wasn't a myth. That There were some kids that got allowed. Yeah, it happened to me. It surely did. It happened to me. It really did. My mom did that. Because mm -hmm. she said that uh, she wouldn't be with me always, and I had to learn how to, ha how to handle money. And when I went to college, I had my own checking account. My classmates now laugh at me. They thought I was from the Rockefeller uh, family because when it was time for us to pay our um, our uh, money for college, I wrote my own personal check. Now, my mama was working. I don't know how many jobs to get that money in that account. <laughs> Because we were, I mean, you know, uh, we were not um, the privileged, educated, professional people. But I did, I did have that. I, I guess I was one of the privileged kids. Yeah, you were, you were unique. <laughs> that's what they tell me now. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, I think <laughs> Jesus's point with this parable was that a slave or a servant 
should not expect a special reward for doing what his duty was. So for those of us that have been told, you know, you make up your bed, clean up your room, wash the dishes, that kind of thing. There's no extra reward in that. Um, Charlene thought that she had been good and needed and wanted something special. Well, that's good. But maybe your parents didn't think you were all that good. You know, that's the problem. Well, so, they weren't going to do, they weren't going to give me anything for it. That's all. You were good because you were supposed to be good. <laughs> that's right. You were supposed to be good. So the, the demanding standards that Christ set may have seemed to be too high for the disciples and they were asking Jesus to increase their faith. But in Jesus's view, these were like the minimal uh, standards for this new covenant that they were under. So their obedience to Christ wasn't anything that was praiseworthy. This was their duty. This was their expectation. So they weren't going to receive or should not expect to receive anything special for just doing their duty. So Jesus is illustrating here with this servants that we are also unworthy servants. Uh, Christians should acknowledge that God owes us nothing and we owe him everything. We even owe him our lives. So um, in the first 10 verses of this Chapter 17, we've looked at um, what offenses were, purposely putting stumbling blocks in people's way. We looked at trespasses, sins against others. We looked at the importance of faith. And then finally, we ended up with servanthood and how our Christ's expectations for servanthood are that we are duty-bound to do, to perform whatever it is he had, has asked us to do, and we are to put our faith, no matter the size of that faith, in him. And he's the one who can make grand, great changes. He's the one who can uproot those deeply seeded roots, those trees, the roots that go deep down into a person. Jesus can uproot that. Um, our key is to pray, which we don't do enough of, um, because if we did, we would probably see a whole lot more being accomplished for the kingdom if we did. So we're still, this is, this is a, a continuous learning thing. The word of God is a living word. Um, it's always applicable to our situation. So even though we may not have been as diligent in the past to pray and to exercise our faith. You know, when you exercise, it's how you get stronger. Your faith gets stronger by using it. So those are the things that we need to focus on in order to accomplish what Christ has asked us and called upon us to do, our duty. And when we do our duty in faith, and we can look to God for whatever in his grace he would reward us with. Not that we're asking for anything, but it's God's grace that rewards us. Any more comments or questions about the lesson? I think you made it plain. Very yeah. good. I hope you hopefully made it plain. <laughs> uh, Miss Teacher, uh, yeah. I like to refer to us to one person that I think that we overlooked it. As a child, I saw the farmer, the farmer, 
has the type of faith that we are talking about here. You know, uh, I, I looked at my father and every year they did the thing that they're supposed to do. Getting the plant bed right. You know, tobacco seeds are real, real small. You couldn't see them. Mm. But they would go out there and do what they're supposed to do. Put those seeds in that bed. Put a strip, uh, cover over it and go on about their business. And How do you know it's going to happen? <laughs> it's going to happen. Yeah. I, I, one, now my father was a type that prop insurance and stuff like that, he didn't take it out. He would plant his stuff. And once he did what he did, he said it's in God's hand. Mm. And it, year in, year out, if they made a bad crop one year, it, they didn't worry about it. Because mm -hmm. they're going to go and do the same thing the next year. Mm. So that's I, I saw them put that faith in practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great example. Any other comments? Okay, Dick, uh, are there any announcements? If not, uh, Deacon Fulton, would you pray us out, please? Let us, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity you've granted us to study your word. Thank you for those that were able to attend today and those that weren't. Heavenly Father, ask your blessing putting the sick and flick throughout the land and country. Heavenly Father, we just ask you to continue grace and mercy to be a book for First Baptist as we go through our transition period. These are another blessing reaction in your son Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. 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 And have a blessed day. Bye. Good evening. Bye.